Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to another video. Today we are working on this brand new Takeda Customs board. Unfortunately, while it was being shipped from Australia to New Zealand, it was dropped from what I can only imagine was about 40 foot in the air straight onto the nose. I've never seen damage like this on a surfboard. It's unbelievable. So I actually got this board in quite a while ago, but I did tell the customer I'm very busy and I don't want to rush this job out just for the sake of rushing it out. So I've been waiting until I'm a little bit quieter to get to this one. Today is Sunday and I am not working, but what I am going to do today is we're going to cut the nose off. I'm going to bring it to my buddy's house and we're going to create the stringer. So the stringer is a custom cedar stringer and it's one eighth of an inch wide. So we're going to cut some cedar up, run it through the thicknesser and recreate that. So tomorrow when I come into work, I have the stringer ready to go and we can start to glue up our new nose on this one. I said I'd do it if it took me all Sunday, which it did, but we got the video out on the Sunday like I said I would. So I'm a man of my word, can't say I'm not. Just using the shape of square here, make sure I get a nice square cut. The flatter or the straighter this cut is, the easier it's going to be to get the new foam on there. If you do a haggard cut and it's at some weird angle, then you have to match that angle with your replacement foam and it turns into a nightmare. So worth drawing that straight line and following it as closely as you can. I actually have a new theory of how this board's nose was damaged. So we all kind of assumed that it had just been dropped from a great height, but there's actually no damage to the tip of the nose itself. The only damage is these kind of creasing and folding spots. So my theory is the board was laying flat in its box, and at each end of the box there was something heavy, maybe a pallet load of something, and the board actually was getting compressed during transit from nose to tail, just being squeezed, squeezed, squeezed. And that nose started to buckle and give way, and then eventually on the major crease point, it just folded in half. So that's my theory, and that's what I reckon happened. A big thank you to the buddy Craig from Lemuria Surfboards for helping me out cutting this stringer. Now that it's cut and we're on the next day, I didn't want to just adhere flat timber to flat timber, so I'm actually going to chisel out a little notch in the original stringer of the board, kind of do a rough tongue and groove sort of setup here so that I can sandwich our new stringer and the little tab I make on it in between the original stringer on the board and hope it just gives a little bit more security to that, that joining, that connection spot. So what we're gonna use here is a marine grade epoxy fairing cream. And this stuff is kind of like car bog in the sense you take an equal amount of part A and an equal amount of part B, you mix it together with the squeegee and it creates a bog. It's definitely not lightweight like a micro balloon Q-cell would be, but it's very strong, it's good for filling gaps and voids. It doesn't slump and drip, so it remains at the same consistency. You don't have to add more of one to thicken it up to your likening. Uh, it just, it is thick and it's very easy to work with. So we're gonna use this stuff just to fill that void in the foam, either side of the stringer, and to actually hold our new stringer in so that we can get that rocker profile set. Once this fairing cream cures, it is as hard as concrete. It's really difficult to sand. So ideally, I don't want to get it on any other parts of the board because I don't want to be sanding it away. So we're just going to do a quick little mask off there. And then I want to use as little as humanly possible during this process because I don't want big globs of it left behind on the foam on the end of the board that we've cut because I'm going to sand through foam and fiberglass much faster than I'll sand through this stuff if there's extra there that I have to sand away. So I'm going to keep this as neat and tidy as humanly possible.
You're probably gonna ask, at this stage of the video, why did you leave the stringer so long? Why didn't you cut it in half at least before you attached it? And the answer to that is, there is no good answer to that. I didn't even think about it at the time, I just stuck it onto the board. It wasn't until I watched the footage afterwards I thought, probably should have cut that a bit shorter. So we couldn't get much more of a convoluted setup. So it was pretty difficult to film and unfortunately my camera kind of didn't film properly anyway. So basically these tapes, bottom and side, are just to kind of pull it into place and hold it there. We then have our inside, or our, I should say, we have our right side of the stringer marked here with this bendy bar. So that runs all the way up to here. And that kind of gives me a guide of where the side of that stringer is running. So then I was able to clamp the bar down because it wants to bounce up. So we've got that clamped down and then just tie and hammer our new stringer to the side of this. And that will hopefully get that stringer pretty true with the original stringer. So it will give that 24 hours to dry and then revisit it tomorrow and hopefully we've done the job. Ooh, stressful. At this point of the video, I will let you know that I have never done this before. I'm completely making this up as I go. But with this job in particular, I really want to get the rocker bang on. If you watch the last ding repair video that I put out, it was also a nose repair, not too dissimilar to this one, but it was a much older board, certainly not the quality of this Takeda that we're working on. And so I freehanded everything. I just took an old bit of foam with a bit of stringer in it, glued it on the end, freehanded the rails, freehanded the outline, freehanded the rocker, and it's always good enough with a board like that. But this one, I really wanted to get the rocker right because the rocker is always the hardest bit to match when you're putting a new nose on a board. All right, so this shit's about to get real complicated, but essentially I've measured the tip of the nose and it's pretty much measuring at half a centimetre, bang on. So we're gonna go with half a centimetre and we can ignore this middle line because I marked it wrong. So our six six is up here. So that's gonna be the tip of the nose. So we just have to create this same rail, uh, rocker line and then we can shave the stringer down to that rocker line. That's the plan anyway, we'll see if it works out. Alright, so obviously this isn't it, but this line here is a straight line from there to there, and this line here is a straight line from there to there. Obviously this rocker is going to curve upwards, same here, it's going to subtly curve. So now I'm going to try and move these points, these end points where the tip of the nose is, I'm going to move them up slightly, so I'll move that one up to about there. I'll move that one up to about there, getting that half a centimetre gap, and then we'll create that curve from this point to our new tip. So I think what we're going to try is from this line here to this line here, that's half a centimetre. So I'm actually going to try and bring this line to this line, and then we'll bring this line this line and see how that's looking. So we're going to clamp this ruler off. I'm going to bend this ruler up to the line that we want. And now we're going to bring this up to this dot here. Alright, that might be it. So we'll rub out the lines that we don't want and then we'll get a clearer idea of how that's going to look. Alright, so we've basically got our rocker profile. We've got that half centimetre nose tip. 
got a little bit of a curve going on. We can always adjust it a little as we sand. This bit here might dip a little too low there. So we might cut it a little above the line and then sand that until we get a good looking shape through this section. But I think this bit will be pretty good. So we'll cut it to length and then start working on bringing it down. Now that we've got that stringer pretty good, you can see there's some highs of that fairing paste left behind, which is what I said I didn't want. So we're gonna get rid of that, starting out by just cutting away the bigger pieces with the Stan Lee, uh, just to get the bulk of that away. And then we can get a bit of 120 paper and just sand both the stringer and the foam, just so we know we're nice and keyed. Our epoxy's gonna stick to it and it's as flat as we can possibly get it. Now that our area is keyed up, uh, I've got an old bit of foam there and we're gonna do one side at a time, so one foam block at a time. And that's only because there's a bit of flex in that stringer that we've added, I wanna make sure that's really straight and lined up with the original stringer of the board. So we're gonna add our foam block to the board here and my stringer is tied off to that uh, metal bendy bar which is lined up with the original stringer. So I'm gonna know my stringer isn't moving and my foam is hugged nice and tight against our stringer. So this board is a PU construction with epoxy resin over the top. But at this point, I'm only trying to adhere PU foam to PU foam and a piece of cedar. So all of this is done with poly, and at this stage when our poly resin is soft but firm, if that makes sense, I'm gonna use the Stanley knife just to cut any excess away so I don't have to sand it later before moving on to the other side. Now that that string is nice and straight, I don't need my bendy bar anymore. I can just glue up my next piece of foam to it and we should be good to go and ready to shape once this poly has kicked off properly. We're gonna wipe away as much resin as we possibly can get to while it's still wet. We just don't wanna be sanding hard resin next to soft foam. So the more we can wipe away and cut away before it fully cures, the easier it's gonna be down the track. We're all glued up, foam is on, and so it is time to try and shape this thing and not destroy it in the process. So keep in mind that our stringer is already shaped to the rocker profile that we want, 
So all we're doing here is bringing the foam down to meet our created stringer and that should in theory give us the perfect rocker. That's the idea anyway. This isn't dissimilar to making your own blank. Um, if you're making EPS blanks at home, you're probably going to do the same thing as this. You're going to make your stringer first, glue your foam blocks to it, and then hot wire or sand your foam down to meet that stringer. So this is just a small version of creating your own blank. So here I'm using a template from a fish that I've got and the nose is pretty similar to what the nose on this board was, at least that last um, six inches of it. But what I want to do first is mark the rails of the template so that after I flip it over to the other side, I'll be able to line up the rails of that template with the beginning of the foam we've just glued on and the tip of the nose. So in this next camera shot just here, if you look at the rails of the template, you'll notice two little dots. One where that pencil's starting there, and one where that pencil's ending there. And that should give us a symmetrical position on each side. I thought this was pretty cool. It sort of made me want to shape a surfboard with the nose of a hammerhead shark because that's sort of what this reminds me of. Maybe a little more refined than this block of foam, but it'd be interesting to have a board with a hammer head on it, I thought anyway. So at this point of the process, we're basically just following the same steps as you would if you were shaping a board. So once our outline is cut, we're gonna square up those rails, make them nice and 90 degrees with this particular jig here. Then after that, we can start putting our rail bands in because we're already squared off from all that planing and sanding. And then once the rail bands are in, we can sort of tie them all together with the screen and get our rail. The only difference here is we kind of have to find the apex, which is that pencil line there, of the original rail so we can kind of recreate that rail as best as possible. The good thing about jobs like this is that rail does tend to change in the last six inches of a board, towards the nose that is, so it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to blend well and look, look natural with the existing rail. Of course the big difference with doing rails on a setup like this is we need to deal with any excess resin that is gluing our foam onto the original board. So I need to sand that down first before I can start putting any kind of rail bands in. Because if I ignore that excess resin and just do the rail bands, I'm gonna have a really high spot where our foam joins onto the original nose of the board. So it's not a product that I use that often, but always handy to keep some spackle around. There's a bunch of different brands. Usually this would be used more on EPS foam, but considering this is epoxy, we've got some voids to fill. We don't want to use something like a resin and a micro balloon mix because it's going to be so hard to sand and not damage our foam at this point. So this stuff has more of a foamy consistency it's going to be easier to sand down flat once it's dried. 
Um, it's an air drying compound, so we will have to wait till tomorrow to do that. But we're going to fill those voids with that, and then when we sand it, it's not going to bring down the foam much faster than it's going to bring down our dried spackle. Spackle will dry out in the container if it's stored for a while without use, so I have added a little bit of water to this just to make it a little more of a creamy consistency. I don't want chunks of dry in there because that'll actually tear my foam when I wipe it off like I'm doing here. Now that all of our spackle is applied, we're going to store it somewhere away and safe where that foam can't be damaged and we'll come back to it tomorrow and give it a screen and see how it looks. I'm not going to lie to you, it is the next day and I was about to sand that spackle and looking at the nose, I did suspect I might have to, but I really don't like the shape of this left side. The rail line and the outline on the right side is fine, but this is no good at all. And I did spend the night kind of thinking about whether or not, quite often with cases like this, you'll find that the cloth and the laminating kind of makes up the difference, so you can get away with little discrepancies like that. But I really don't think that the lamination is going to hide that shitty outline. So we're gonna take a step backwards and I'm actually gonna remove this portion of foam, put a new portion and shape it, maybe even template this side so then I can get them the same. So that's gonna be the plan for today. Good times. This is pretty painful. Many people have brought up in comments on my other videos my Lamb of God logo which I put on all boards that I laminate. And it's a lamb's head, little cute lamb within a pentagram, an inverted pentagram. And I've had comments and questions asking if I'm a Satanist and do I know what it means and all the rest. So I thought I'd tell you the history behind the Lamb of God logo and name. So there's another ding repairer about an hour away from me and the original owner of that, the business is now sold, so um, I can't talk about the new guy. I've spoken to him once, he seems like a nice guy. But the original guy who owned and started that company, we had a little bit of beef at one point. So a New Zealand magazine did an article on me and my ding repairs a few years ago now, and I did the interview and everything, and they took photos, and it was a great article, but when they brought it out, they titled the article, The King of Dings. And I'll give you one guess what this business is called. The world's most original ding repairer's name, of course it is Ding King. So suffice to say, the then owner of Ding King New Zealand was pretty pissed off with me because there was an article on me calling me the King of Dings. And I got some messages from him on Instagram complaining of this fact. He was not happy at all. And I did try to explain to him that, hey man, I just did the interview. I didn't get to title it. But he didn't really seem happy with that answer. And yeah, quite begrudged, I would say. By the end of it, I had to kind of politely tell him to um, bugger off, for lack of better words. And a few months later, I started realizing that when he was contract glassing boards for other shapers, he used a Lamb King logo. It was quite a cool logo. It was a little cartoon lamb, and it said Lamb King on it, a play on the words of Ding King, of course. It was a cool logo, and I thought it was clever. And I thought to myself, well, how could I be any better than a Ding King or a Lamb King? So I came up with Lamb of God. Lamination is fiberglassing, Lamb, so that's a play on words, and Lamb of God is also a very famous, very well-known metal band. 
So I can tell you that, yes, I have read all of Anton LaVey's books. I enjoyed them. Yes, I do sacrifice virgins and goats on a regular basis. But no, the Lamb of God logo has nothing to do with any of that. Nailed it. Definitely making the template on the original side was the way to go. Much happier with that now. Now we've got a spackle again because the new side has a couple of little gaps. So we're actually two days behind on this job now because we need a drying time for the new piece of foam to go on. So that was overnight. And now we're gonna leave the spackle until tomorrow as well. Then we can sand all that and paint it. So the spackle is soft enough uh, that I can just screen it as I would normally finish off a board and that's gonna bring the spackle down to the foam level. So no difficult sanding with this stuff. It's definitely worth keeping spackle around. The next stage I need to remove, or I need to sand behind all of that foam nose that I've put on so that I can wrap some cloth and it adheres. And I wanna get rid of those pink pin stripes as well because we're gonna have to repaint them. So we're gonna bring them away and not get pink foam dust all over our fresh white foam on the nose. Once that spackle's brought down and it's all screened off, we can draw our rail lines for our paint job, mask them off and get some paint on it. And we're basically on easy street now. All the hard stuff is out of the way, so we just gotta take a little bit of care with the paint and the lamination, but this is all pretty standard stuff from this point forward. If you've been watching my videos for a while, I feel like I have enough content on the channel now where Basically all these methods are there, you just have to kind of dig through the channel and find them. But the process from this point onwards, um, it, it's pretty standard procedure of what I do every day with a lot of boards. One thing that isn't so standard here is, although this is a PU blank, like I said, it is epoxy resin, and I've told you in countless amounts of videos, don't put paint underneath epoxy resin, and this is usually something I would avoid, but I didn't really have a choice on this particular board because it is paint under resin, which I have to match. So I have very little doubt in my mind that Takeda Customs, the shaper of the board, he most likely used a water-based paint underneath uh, his fiberglass cloth. I haven't in this case, I've used Molotov, but it is a pretty light paint job and a pretty small area. So I'm reasonably confident that if I focus on the lamination enough, I should remain problem free with any um, weird effects the paint might have on the epoxy. But that doesn't mean to say I now recommend putting paint under epoxy. I definitely don't recommend that.
As is the way with epoxy, between each coat, before you put resin on top of cured epoxy, you need to sand it to key it. So we're doing two things here. We're feathering down our edges, which is what I'm doing here. So any cloth edge, I want to feather that into the board. And then once all those edges are feathered, I just want to key up. I don't want to sand my cloth away and weaken it, but I still need to key it for my next layer of cloth to adhere to it and any further resin. So we're just kind of roughly going over it to key it up, getting rid of any little spiky bits or high bits on the nose and ready for our next layers on the deck side. So the glassing schedule on this board is each patch like this that covers my join between what I've shaped and the original board, both top side and underside is a four ounce layer of glass. And then each large patch that wraps the rails is a six ounce layer of glass. So that's gonna give us 12 ounces of glass over the rails and 10 ounces of glass over that join where I've glued my foam onto the original board. Once all the cloth is on, those edges are feathered back, we're ready for our resin coat. So on the deck side, I'm positioning the board kind of on a horizontal rack so the nose is flat. If I had it on just a normal rack, it would all drain towards the middle of the board, which isn't ideal. So you want to be able to level the board out so that your working space is flat. Once that side cures, we're going to flip it over, mask off for the other side and apply the resin the same way and then we're ready to sand for paint. We've got to put those pinstripes back. So we're going to start this sanding process at 240, and that's going to bring away or take away any of our 120 scratches that we've put in thus far. And then once we've done 240, we can do 320 on the orbital, and then we're going to move it outside and sand everything to 400 wet, and then 600 wet. And then we're ready to put our pinstripes on. Usually with neon colours like this, it's recommended that you put a, so for instance, we've got a neon pink here. So if I was going to do a board in neon pink, I'd put just a regular pink underneath first and then put the neon over the top. Because neon colours do have a tendency to fade. And if you don't have a colour underneath, then it just doesn't look right. It kind of goes see-through when it fades. With the pinstripes though, I don't want to build them up and have them really thick. So this is just a straight neon paint where it should be and if the pinstripes bugger out in the end the customer will have to bring them back and we can always redo them if it does start to fade. So the issue we're facing here is you can see kind of where I've repaired that it's shiny and the rest of the board is not and you'll hear my hand here So this board has been finished off by the shaper with a matte clear and at the moment I'm dealing with a fiberglass that's sanded to 600 wet so compared to a matte clear it's polished. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to sand my area to 800 and then just quickly go over the whole board with 800. Not crazy, I'm not trying to sand that matte clear off but just kind of clean it up because it's been in the workshop for a while. And then I'm going to reapply matte clear on my area and try to match the finish that the shaper originally put on the board. It 
Ladies and gentlemen, we have done it. While this job isn't 100% perfect, I would dare say it's high 90s. I'm pretty happy with it. I hope I've done Takeda Customs justice, and I'm happy to get the customer back in the water to finally try this board that he bought around Christmas time. On the last repair video I did, we discussed pricing, and I did say that I could disclose the prices of these repairs. So I can tell you that this repair cost 300 New Zealand dollars, and from memory it was slightly discounted because this is a pretty loyal customer of mine. He brings me a lot of work, he's a nice guy, and honestly I felt really terrible for him that this happened to his brand new board. On that previous video, the other nose job we did, I asked you to guess in the comments what you thought that job would have cost and if you guessed two hundred and fifty dollars you were bang on the money so congratulations to you you win nothing but well done anyway if you're still here after 36 minutes and 10 seconds well done to you you have a great attention span i hope you got something from this video i hope it was somewhat entertaining hit the subscribe button hit the like button leave a comment share it do all the stuff youtubers tell you to do and we'll see you in the next one guys appreciate you watching have a good one. Choo-hoo!